Um, so, how's it been going the last two years? It's been a weird time, right? <laughs> John, you've been a teacher at UC Riverside for how many years? Professor? Uh, 32. 10 years at Cal Arts, 32 at Riverside. Wow. UC. And how has um, teaching changed, not just over the last two years, but over all that time, uh, the, the practice of teaching photography? Over all that time? <laughs> uh, uh, we're a pretty small group, and I think we're not going to speak all that long, so formulate questions about anything that has to do with at least photography. Rebecca can answer all the art stuff. Um, <laughs> how has it changed? Uh, well, I was born kind of mid 20th century, so the, the medium has changed dramatically. When I first started out, it was black and white photography, what we now call analog photography with silver, black and white prints. And then in the late 70s, I started doing color. And then, of course, we have the digital revolution and the transition to digital now and all at home. You know, you can buy a drone and fly it around and zoom through people's houses if you want to make photographs or take a little ball, throw it up in the air. It's a 360-degree image. So teaching has changed. Uh, the pandemic definitely changed it. I was telling Rebecca, it used to be I, since I had a kind of expertise in color, I taught a lot of color, and it was analog color photography. So, uh, in black, in beginning photography, we would just teach kind of analog black and white photography, then we would teach color photography. We had a, a color processor, so shoot film, and you would just push it through this machine, it would drop out the other side, and you know, a color photograph. And it was actually a very easy way to make something quite convincing. Uh, and, uh, analog color photography was probably one of the most benevolent kind of uh, processes in terms of ease. Uh, then, uh, so we used to teach beginning classes five weeks uh, analog, five weeks digital, and now we just teach digital. And so the pandemic comes along, and the students can't even check out cameras. And uh, I'm, I'm looking at them on Zoom, and some of them are in their cars, some are in their bed, they don't want to like turn on the camera. And it's just like a giant grid of images. And I don't know, all of you have done Zoom. You can, you can like click this button where you have a grid of all the people or just whoever's talking. And since I'm doing all the talking, it's me. And, and so I, 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 would, I would tell people, it's kind of like you stick your head up through a hole and you've got like 20 people looking at your face and two feet away. So uh, it, it's difficult, difficult to teach that way. Uh, the thing where you share imagery, where somebody shows, shares their desktop, that works pretty well. Uh, the, in, so everybody, since they couldn't check their cameras, they're all using the iPhones primarily. And there's a whole generation of people for whom the default orientation of the photograph is vertical, not horizontal. My entire life, the default is horizontal. We would call vertical portrait you call it horizontal landscape. Uh, now there's a whole generation of people for whom the idea of turning the cameras the sideways is like, what? Why would I turn it sideways? Uh, so everything starts out vertically and not horizontally. So, I mean, that's an interesting thing to talk about. And it's uh, the other very interesting thing that's gone on is uh, the internet and the fact that, you know, like we're in this kind of golden age of photographic book. People love photographic books. People buy a lot of photographic books. That would have that surprised me that that happened because it seems kind of retro. But really, when you think about it, the vast majority of images, even if you're talking about art, art photography, you see on the computer. So that becomes the primary arena of discourse uh, in a in a way that's really interesting and almost impossible to talk about. In, in a coherent way because it hasn't shaken out in any kind of, I mean, you have these different constituencies of interest and you don't have, it's not curated the way an art magazine was curated or the kinds of mechanisms through which one originally experienced the discourse of a particular medium. So it's interesting and unsettling times in all manners of ways. That's my ramble. I don't know where we started. <laughs> How do you find um, that shift to um, internet consumption of images affects you and your own work? 
Uh, I am a uh, yeah, unrepentant and uh, promiscuous Instagram poster. Uh, so if, if somebody like calls me about an image and happens to be on my desktop, I'll throw it on Instagram. Or if I go out and photograph, and I photograph with a for my digital camera, now I go home with like 150 exposures as I got on my computer. I pick four, I throw on Instagram the next couple of days because it, it weirdly puts it at arm's distance from me. Even though it's the exact same, it's on my computer just as it was before I stuck it on Instagram. Something about putting it there gives me a kind of distance. It also lets me see it again, because I did, the first time I would have gone and edited them, you know, unless I'm going to make a print, I'm not going to spend any time with that image. So it brings it back up a few times. So I, I find it really useful for me. And it's like I have this weird little radio station of images that I can like throw out to the world. And so I use it, and I, like, I also use Facebook. But I unfriended absolutely everybody that wanted to talk about politics. So now all I see are images from people all over the world that are interested in what I'm interested in, in photography. So I see a lot of interesting stuff uh, that I wouldn't see otherwise. And uh, so, yeah, I, I, I use it. I don't know what to make of it. I don't know if it means anything. Uh, in any kind of way, but it, it, I, I'm a particular demographic that I don't get to put my work out a lot in the world right now. It's a way for me to throw out my, my work into the world and uh, have it circulate in a certain way, which is not ideal. Like, Instagram's terrible in terms of how it renders images. Facebook's a little better. You can click on it and get a nice big image, but then only your quote-unquote friends see it. Um, so that's, that's where I am with the internet. So speaking of your work, there are two photographs behind us on the wall um, that are about 20 years apart. Um, so the earlier one being from your Zuma series. Will you tell us about um, the genesis of that series and, and what you did okay. to make uh, those photos? Uh, 1977 is that photograph. Uh, and from 1971 to 1974, I was in graduate school in UCLA. And around 1970, I don't know how this could go on for it. Um, <laughs> not gonna believe it either. Uh, from 1971 to 72, I was making social landscape kind of photography. I lived in the San Fernando Valley. And I, uh, and I just used to get on my bicycle and ride around the neighborhood where I lived. And, Photograph people with a large lawns and bushes and some of the just houses from a distance. And that was kind of the, the, the kind of social landscape was kind of the primary uh, kind of modality in fine art photography at the time. Uh, you know, uh, Walker Evans had had an, an, an exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art around 1971. He was kind of like a prototype for this kind of modernist attitude of photography, which is that, okay, you know, if, if photography is ever going to be a viable medium, it has to be by virtue of what it does uniquely. It's kind of unique fidelity of representation. It's, it's, it's uh, and, uh, and, and one of the models of that, if, if it's about the fidelity of this, then, then, you know, you don't want a lot of artistic affectation. You don't want the pictorial, you want some kind of directness, un unmediated kind of pointing to information in the world. And this is what was primarily valorized. I think Walker, Walker Evans' famous quotes was that, I don't know what art photography is, but under no circumstances should be done near the ocean. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which, which, which is about sort of, okay, you don't want to be picturesque, right? You don't want to. That. So, um, so that, and I was sort of, Sort of doing that, but um, and I would go, but at the same time, I, I was sort of just I started out in photography, not in art, but then getting to sort of look at a lot of art at that time. Sort of Andy Warhol and Robert Rauschen were kind of the two most people <coughs> for art and photography, and then a lot of people doing kind of earthworks and a lot of performances like documentation of that stuff. And I began to think of my process as being important. I kept thinking, OK, 
okay, here I leave my house and move through this environment, I take this machine and I make that kind of imprint of what's in front of me. And I come home and I've got all these imprints and I organize them and I do something with them. And I begin more and more to identify with the process of doing it. But then I would show them to people and I would have like pictures of women watering lawns or I would have pictures of uh, suburban, I lived in Priscilla in the same thing, you know, sort of a kind of generic uh, blue collarish uh, uh, neighborhood. And people always thought that I was commenting on the environment that I was making fun of the people. Like, oh, don't they look funny? Or, oh, isn't this bleak? Or, and I always found that reception of the word frustrating because I wasn't commenting on, on, the, on the environment. It was my environment. It, it was more about my literal engagement in this place. So I began to, uh, so I finished actually a body that work in 73, and I had a show at UCLA, I got my master's degree, and I had another year to get my MFA degree. And I ended up being in a band in house of spring painting, uh, which I came to for some very weird reasons, but uh, I began to see that as a way, well, okay, so my process becomes an unavoidable component of the work. The fact that I've been in there, that I've acted in front of the camera, that, that you can't avoid the implications of my presence and my behavior. Uh, so I did a whole lot of work in like 73, 74, 75, black and white square photographs, and I was living in Venice at the time, and I was at Zuma Beach, that's called the Zuma Series, I usually have very flat-footed, unimaginative titles for things, so that's why it's the Zuma Series. And I was running on the beach, and I came across this house. And it, 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 Zuma Beach is a county beach, so uh, there's no private homes, but this home, I think, had preceded the county taking over the beach. And the lifeguards lived there. And, uh, it was a two-story house. Lifeguards lived there, but when I was running by it, it was abandoned because they had built like a real, like official lifeguard building. And I think it's one of those classic county things where they forgot to put the budget to tear down the old building in there when they decided to put the budget to build a new building. So it sort of sat there for a while. And I was uh, teaching at Loyola Marymount University, and uh, and uh, one day I had a terrible little classroom. Of a science building, a little black and white dark room. Uh, so the art department had no resources. It was half nuns, actually, because they'd come over from Marymount and it was like a, they could keep a presence in the art department. And Sister Ricci used to pat me on the head and say, How are you doing with the children? Because I had long hair, so you trust me. Um, but anyway. So I was in what was called my office there, and I got a call, and it was uh, somebody from the communications department that built a brand new communications building. And, uh, and, and the person on the phone says, hey, look, we've got this brand new communications building, and they, they put a colored dark room in the basement of the building, and none of us here know what to do with it or why they did it, but they did. So why don't you come over and take a look at it? So I go over, and it's a little colored dark room. It's got all the equipment in it. A little color processor that's from the spins with the image on it. Well, cool. So I, I taught myself how to print color in that little color dark room, and I was experimenting around with color. And so I, I came across this house and I thought, well, you know, I'm going to start playing around with that. And so I had already done a lot of painting in abandoned houses. And uh, so it made sense to paint there. So I went to, uh, what was the name? Standard Brands. I cheap paint and I bought some color paint. And that is a kind of outlier because I didn't paint in that photograph. That blue stick was already in the plate. I put the blue stick in the window, but that's the only thing I did. And 95% uh, of the photographs in that series I painted somewhere on the inside of the house. And I bought an electronic flash, which was a, kind of a newish thing at the time. I remember I was using flash bulbs for the black and white photographs. And uh, I started using strobe flash on the inside and going into that house. And I had a Pentax 6x7 camera that uh, synced at a 30th of a second. So the flash is on and off very, very quickly. And you have to sync when it goes off before the shutter opens up all the way. And have cameras that have focal plane shutters like my Pentax 
can only be synced at a, at a, a fairly slow speed, which is 30 per second or slower. I could go into that for a minute. Uh, so I could only photograph it was, it wasn't very bright outside the window. So I'd get up at 5 in the morning and go either early in the morning or I'd go late in the afternoon and I'd paint in the house and I'd photograph it. I did that for about six or seven months and then it showed up and the house had been taken away. And so I didn't have to deal with a lingering point of diminishing returns uh, that had one has to usually deal with those bodies of work. So that's the Zuma series. Uh, they did a body of work in between the vandalism and the Zuma, but it was good now. <laughs> okay. So were you thinking about Walker Evans uh, admonishments? I love Walker Evans. I, <laughs> to not I, flutter up by the ocean? <laughs> Well, no, I, I actually I don't think I knew that quote at the time, but I don't know that I would have stopped. Uh, yeah. uh, see, the, the thing was about color at that time, it's like everybody who was a serious photographer didn't do color. Even though you could do color, it, it was, uh, I remember uh, Louis Balls told me it was vulgar to do color. And, uh, because it, it, was, it, it, it was thought of like, okay, everything that's really essential like the materiality of the world, the texture of the world, the quality of the light, that's all there in black and white. All color adds is this kind of superficial frosting in a certain way. I mean, and that was kind of the general feeling about color. And I thought, well, if it's frosting, the hell, you know, frost the hell out of it, you know. Uh, so. So then we sort of fast forward 20 years to uh, these isolated houses in the desert. And I imagine that um, things have also changed in terms of attitude towards um, like color and photography. And there's been a, a shift, right, in the world of fine art photography. Can you speak a little bit about that? Okay. Uh, yeah, so mid 1980s. Um, so I did a lot of things between those two photographs that tend to go through bodies of work. And uh, in the 1980s, I was doing a lot of photographs. I was teaching in Cal Arts most of the, in the 1980s. And it, it was this time of a kind of postmodernist discourse about where, you know, the conditions of reception of the viewer become kind of more primary. And I was dealing a lot with exhausted iconography of the swan. So I would make like tornadoes, or I would make like out of paper mache, or I would make different kinds of uh, iconography that was kind of related to the sublime. I would take it out in the nature, or I would photograph it in the studio. Or, uh, and all of that culminated around 1990, where I did a body work where I would kind of shamelessly paint backdrop paper with kind of a mixed right expressionistic marks and throw hands full of flour at it and get a puff of smoke and make a, a flash photograph of it. And so they're kind of evocative of the, the cosmos, the sublime, or whatever. And I mean, you know, they're huge, like big metal frames. I, I wanted something that was kind of dead. I was kind of seeing photography as if this thing pops out of the machine, it's like this dead industrial thing. And I just wanted something that was emphatically kind of dead, mute but was the most ambitious and possible iconography. So that was kind of the culmination of that trajectory throughout the 1980s, and then I ended up there. And then I got a residency at, uh, we've got these labs over there. Um, I got a residency at the uh, at Yosemite. And uh, so and what a residency at Yosemite meant was that you got this, uh, I think it was like around, April-ish. There's a, a hotel there called the Bowona, and uh, there's a bunch of cabins next to it. And the people that work in the valley, the Bowona is not in the valley, but it's kind of adjacent, lived in those little cabins during the summer, and then during the winter, the cabins are empty. So that was the residence. Okay, have you get this cabin? We'll see you later. So I'm in this cabin, and you're in Yosemite where Carlton Watkins, this and Ansel Adams will photograph, what are you going to do, right? So, um, so I just started going into the valley and I had, uh, and I had my view camera and I had all that stuff, but then I had this 35 millimeter camera and I was starting to use this film called recording film. And again, I was very interested in, in kind of the materiality and, and visceral nature of, the, of, of silver on paper print. 
And so I was making these very grainy photographs, and I ended up fixating on people wandering off into nature, because I've been dealing with this idea of the supply, and I thought, well, maybe I'll deal with it literally, like this desire to get outside of nature, so, so I can get out of your car and just sort of wander into nature, and the line kind of moves in front of you. So I came back with all these very grainy photographs of people like wandering off into nature. And then I decided I would do a body of work called Four Landscapes. I'd do that in the four different ecologies of Southern California. So there's five Prince of Yosemite called Occupied Landscapes. There's five little isolated houses in the desert. There's five stray dogs in the city. And there's five little boats out of the sea. So, so again, that body of work was kind of like trying to make a literal this idea, this figurative idea of the, this, this desire to get outside or beyond the colonial. So I did that body work all black and white. But when I was out in the desert, I kept a light. I was photographing a lot in this place near 29 Palms called Wonder Valley. And man, the light is so beautiful. And I don't know, driving out in the desert in the winter, it's like you're on some dirt road. It's just like so idyllic. And so then I decided I would go back to the medium format color felt camera and I would make photographs of isolated houses, which I felt a little guilty about. <laughs> I, mean, I was thinking, well, these are really kind of conventional, and but I, you know, I was old enough then. What was I? Don't know, Forty older? I'm not sure. Um, I'd have to do the math. But um, I said, you know, I'm entitled. I could. So I, I did this body work of isolated houses, and, uh, and I, it was the most enjoyable body of work I've ever done. Just driving out there at the end, you know, coming through the windows. You know, so I, I just loved it out there. I made that body of work of isolated houses. What, um, what were the qualities of each of the houses that you picked to photograph that drew you to them? Well, um, so that area out there had homestead. So you, if you would, uh, if you would build a house of a certain minimum size, and you would live in it for a couple of years, the government would sell it to you for almost no money. So the distribution of the houses along the desert there are artificially distributed because normally people would cluster the houses, you know, in order to get water for all kinds of other reasons. But here, it's kind of art, just like the, the dispersion of the gas across the desert uh, floor. So I was, I was interested in that history a little bit, and I was, I was just interested in, in the idea of it. So a lot of them, like, this is a, a more kind of extensive house than most of the photographs of that body were. Well, some of them look like monopoly houses. But, and there's just something about the houses that, that, that kind of an emblem of habitation, you know, a kind of minimum level of habitation. And, and, you know, it's painted in these kind of Home Depot colors. And then, you know, the desert gives you this incredible horizon line, right? It's like, so you get, you get to deal with this kind of volume of, of the structure in relation to the depth of, of, the, of, the, of the desert floor, uh, which is something that when you grow up in California, you don't realize the different, I used to teach in the summer a, a graduate program at Bard College. They have a, a graduate art program. And I would go back there. I would just go for a month. It was a two-month program, but I'd just go for a month. And I'd take all my gear with me. And I'd go out and photograph all these damn trees in the way. You know, it's like I, I, I couldn't photograph. I, I was so accustomed to having that kind of depth and being able to play things off of that depth that, you know, if I had stayed there long enough, I think I could have figured out something to do with it. But it, it's, it's, it's really, especially out in the desert, there's something unique. You know, the desert is really kind of defined by absence, right? It's like, okay, there's no water, there's no trees, and, and, and of course, there's all kinds of things. But uh, that, you know, that gives everything a certain kind of existential hum, right? It, it's like when something is there, it some, has a kind of weight that's somehow different than a landscape that's just full of stuff, right? When I look at these photographs, I've always wondered um, if anyone ever came running out of their home to chase you off their property. Yes. Uh, well, there's, yeah. I have a couple stories. Uh, I, I had an old Volkswagen Jetta. And, you know, it's like, 
now I have like a Jeep, a four-wheel drive Jeep. Nobody that has like a good car like that lives out there. It's like people who drive them over the and stuff like that. But um, so I was in my Volkswagen, and, uh, and and then I I bought a new pickup truck. I never I had bought a new truck, a new car before. And I bought this big full-size Chevy Silverado, a white pickup truck, uh, not extended cab, just a regular one. And if you're a photographer, there's nothing better on earth than a white pickup truck because you can walk, you can park, you can park a generic white pickup truck anywhere. People think you're a contractor or whatever. No, <laughs> but anyway, it was a V8. So I got talked to. The first time I was out there, I got stuck. I never got stuck before because I wasn't going to drive the Jetta through something where it looked like I get stuck. I immediately drove through something where it looked like I get stuck, and I got stuck. You, know, you always tell those like pieces of cardboard on the side, pieces of cardboard, you know, where people got stuck. So I get stuck, and I start walking around, like going to houses, and. Uh, and I come up to this house that's got like the, the kind of doily kind of curtains, and it's got this weird new age music, and they very hesitantly knock on the door. This guy comes to the door without a shirt, a beard, what, what do you want? And so, oh, my car stuck, you know, and you can see it there, and go, oh, it's a bad spot. And then he and another guy come out, and they've got a four wheel drive Toyota, and they go over there, and they, they pulled me out, it was totally cool. And, um, and then once I, was driving the wife of the times a Jeep. I got a flat tire and uh, I went to change the tire and it had those tire locks on it. Didn't have the little little key thing to take the, the bolt off, so I was totally stuck. And I flagged down a guy in an old old small wheel. He said, Oh yeah, my brother sent me out here, I've had drug problems. I went to his little house. He was totally nice. And then I had some people chase me down once because they thought I was cooking meth. <laughs> people, I guess, go to some of those abandoned houses and cook meth and they trade, you know, track me down, honking at me. And then they saw the camera. Oh, okay. I couldn't get that. But I, I normally don't have, I spend a lot of time in abandoned places. And I don't normally have a problem. Who has questions for John? Uh, I'd like to hear the story of how you got into painting inside houses. Uh, well, okay, uh, it's not a very good story. Uh, I was photographing with 35 millimeter camera, and I went out one day, and uh, I had photographed some silver butane tanks. And I came home, and I printed this silver butane tank photo. And there's something that, you know, uh, a conventional analog photograph is silver on paper, right? It's, and when you photograph something silver, it's something other than gray in a conventional black and white photograph. It really looks like silver. And I'm thinking, well, that looks great, but this isn't a very interesting photograph. But I wonder what I could do with that idea. And I thought, well, I could buy some silver spray paint. And I could just paint stuff silver. So I went to Standard Brands, I bought a bunch of silver stripes from me. And I started driving around, and you really realize you can't just stop and paint anything you want silver. It all belongs to people, right? And so I'm driving around, driving around, and, and I see this abandoned house that's like 1973. There's lots of abandoned houses. There was a big recession at the time. Like maybe a, a room would burn off the house, and people sort of just walk away from it, which is there for a year and a half, empty. So I went onto that. A lot of them ran some oranges on the tree, silver, and photographed it. I found some silver wingtip shoes in the yard and photographed it. And then I ended up in the house and started spraying in the house. And then I go back and look at those negatives and go, oh, hey, okay, wait a minute, you know, oh, there's corners. I can play with the space in the corner by spraying different kinds. So I had a review once and somebody wrote really pejoratively. And Mr. DeVol apparently thinks one thing just leads to another. And, and I'm thinking, yeah, totally. One thing does just kind of lead to another, and, and it was totally the case there. And, and, it, and the context led to it, right? It was like I'm at UCLA, I'm seeing a lot of art, I'm seeing a lot of documentation of performance and minimalist works or earthworks photographically. So, so the idea of that. There did not necessarily need to be an original, 
that, that, that there's some kind of weird inter some kind of representational space between uh, the perception and the act that's going to be a primary space uh, just seem to make sense.
the expectation that you're going to have a vocational, direct vocational trajectory. Graduate school is a whole different question. Now, in my particular university, we only take four graduate students per year. And that's not just photography, that's everything. Because I don't think, just like philosophy, I don't think that many people. I think unless you have an absolute irrational, like, uh, like engagement with the idea of being an artist, you should go to graduate school. Because there is no guaranteed vocational tract, even with a graduate degree in art. Just as there's not in philosophy. Right. And the same with philosophy. You shouldn't study philosophy unless you can't think of anything other than philosophy. That's the first thing you should study philosophy. Now, in terms of students, I tell them, if you want to make a living, you should develop your digital skills. Because the one thing that's happened is that everything has become digital in some manner. I mean, visual in some manner. Things that before were purely text now have visual components are communicated visually. So having, and I hate that word visual literacy, but having a component or having a capacity to understand how to use visual information, how to modify visual information, and how to deal with visual, digital, uh, visual information digitally is a very valuable uh, vocation skill. And I think people can very much use that. So when people ask me, I emphasize that uh, in terms of vocation. Well, thank you, John, for being with us today. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.